This is the Domain Magnet Show, where you'll learn everything you need to know about buying, optimizing, and selling online businesses with your host, Michael Baraslavsky. This podcast is sponsored by Domain Magnet. Go to domainmagnet.com and join our newsletter to follow all the recent developments in the space of buying and selling online businesses. And today we have Ricky from Income School. Hi, Ricky. Excited to have you. Hey, Michael. I'm glad to be here. So you teach people how to start a profitable blog and basically from scratch and build it up to a point that we can earn enough uh, to, to quit that job. Is that right? Yeah, basically the, um, the main goal at Income School is to help people to be uh, financially secure. And so uh, a big part of our audience are people who are in the space of build, blogging, um, building niche websites, and uh, they, they're trying to learn more. Some are total beginners. Some have been doing it for a while, but just not quite successful yet. And so um, we're helping those people to build those up, usually to a point of replacing their full-time income. Um, and that's that's really the goal. That's pretty cool. And so let's start by just tell us briefly about Income School. How long have you guys been doing it? Like how many people have you been able to help build successful, profitable websites or even quit their jobs and replace the living with that? Yep. Well, um, Income School has been around for about six and a half years. I was started by um, my former business partner, Jim Harmer and myself about six and a half years ago. Um, and I say former is actually just in the last couple of months that um, he's decided he's going, um, we, you know, we met about this and he, speaking of buying and selling online businesses, um, he's moving in the direction of building up his own uh, and focusing more on the, the building up of his, his business, his websites, uh, YouTube channel, et cetera. Um, and I am building income school. And so just as of a couple of months ago, now income school is uh, my business, but I have an excellent team there. Um, so anyway, a little bit of history <laughs> there, I guess. Um, but over the last six and a half years, it took a few years to really hit our stride um, and to even really get noticed. But in the last few years, we've, uh, we've had our Project 24 membership, and that's where um, you know, we actually do really start helping and mentoring people um, besides just, you know, broadly on our YouTube channel. So on the YouTube channel, um, we've, you know, we've helped lots of thousands of people to be able to, uh, learn things. But again, we, where they're not our members, we don't get to really track that within the membership within project 24, um, over a hundred members have their self-reported have reported that they've achieved their full-time income. And with us, the goal is where we're starting from scratch and building up an or a really organic business. Uh, the goal is 24 months. And so um, considering the membership's been around about three years, uh, we, we see that as a good success rate. Uh, and now we're excited to see as we go forward and, and more than just, you know, three years have passed, uh, they're, they're starting to come in quickly. Uh, every week we're having new people report. Um, and then we've had hundreds of people report um, earning over $1,000 a month from their little blog. So these are people who started from scratch, started from the beginning, and uh, they're on their way. So it's really exciting. And a handful of members that are uh, well in the seven, uh, seven figures, or sorry, um, five figures per month, um, and you know, meaning in the six and even seven figures per year. So it's, it's pretty awesome to see some of those early members um, really hit those high levels of success. Very nice. And so what exactly is a member of Income School? Do they go through a series of courses? Is there a certain uh, like timeline or how does it work? Yeah, we have um, inside of our membership, we call it Project 24 because the goal um, is 24 months to replace your full-time income. Uh, that's just kind of the, the average goal that, that we created uh, based on a timeline that Jim and I decided upon a few years ago that we thought was reasonable. Um, some people, it's more like a project 36. Uh, they admit that right off. They say, you know, I'm not putting as much into this, but, um, but basically that, that is how it works. We have a series of courses uh, that provide basically the whole roadmap. On top of that, we provide a, a, we have our own private podcast that's for members only where we talk about 
the things that we're, we're doing and testing right now that maybe aren't quite polished enough for a course, but they're the things that we're testing, keeping people up to speed on just everything that's happening uh, in the industry. And then we have a community, um, a private community for members only where people are just in there every, every day supporting one another um, that we, um, all of us at Income School participate in to, to help members. And so between that the courses um, and then a handful of just additional resources, anytime things come along, we found um, a couple of years ago, uh, we had the request, can you guys just make like a glossary of terms, a little dictionary of uh, internet marketing, SEO terminology, because some of the things you say, I don't know what they mean. And so like, as we started putting it together, we realized there are well over a hundred um, terms and acronyms that we use in this industry that a beginner just does not know. And so some people find that really helpful. So we, we just try to add in additional resources whenever we find something that people would find beneficial. But it, it really is um, built around the step-by-step -step, um, coursework that helps people build their sites. All right, very nice. And how big is your community currently? Uh, how many members do you have now? So currently we have um, to be, the exact number is, uh, well, partly, uh, I, I didn't bring it in part because it's it's a little bit of an insider thing, um, but we do have a few thousand active members in Project 24 today. I would say who are active participants in our community. I mean, there are some who just really like, they're just getting to work and they don't, they, they, they kind of watch in the community, but, but they're spending most of their time working on it. Within the community, there are several hundred members though that are just in there every day helping each other out, um, which is fantastic because we have a handful of members who just pop in to ask a question. And we've got just tons of members who are in there who have been around for a little while, who are jumping on top of answering and helping out. So uh, it's a very, very active group with um, a few thousand members. Very nice. That sounds like a really wholesome place and people helping each other uh, grow yeah. their businesses. And what what kind of businesses do people start? Are they are they all doing more or less similar like blogs, content blogs, or is it all kinds of different things? The majority of them are, um, it's focused around the blog um, or, you know, uh, the niche website, right? Which is really, it's a blog um, with it, with focused on this particular niche, um, a particular topic. But we do have several members who um, maybe are coming from a different place. We have a handful who uh, started off with an e-commerce business. And, you know, the e-commerce business was relying mostly on paid ad traffic to get people to the website. Um, and where by building up the blog now, following the exact same methodologies, um, now they're getting all of their traffic from just organic search. And that traffic is turning into customers. And so um, uh, one member in particular, we interviewed on our YouTube channel about a year ago, who uh, he's he's getting way more sales now than he ever did uh, through his e-commerce business, but he doesn't pay for any, uh, any ads. He doesn't use paid traffic anymore. And so really the way we look at it is um, we just teach people how to use content uh, to drive traffic to their sites. And then monetization can go really any, any direction. We have people who their businesses are built around service consulting, uh, et cetera. Um, uh, so, and others who are built around digital products. And so when a lot of people think of blogs and niche sites, they're thinking of really passive income models. Um, and I'd say that's the majority of people, you know, affiliate marketing, um, and then, you know, the placement of ads on your sites and just kind of leave it as a pretty passive business, uh, create the content, let it be, but others are building, you know, businesses of all types and just using the content as, as a means to drive traffic. Right, very good. And do people who who start services businesses, for example, tend to 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 get a certain revenue mark much faster versus ad business ad ad generated revenue businesses or affiliate? Are you seeing some trends like that, or is it more or less similar? It really when you um, when you add in a more you know professional service or digital product, or oftentimes uh, 
when I say digital product, oftentimes it's more like a, a course or um, even other people's memberships of different types. We find that those types of offerings do uh, bring in a lot more revenue typically than uh, the totally passive income streams. So, uh, I mean, we, we like to consult with and, and interview members pretty frequently, and we'll see people in some of the most random niches that you thought, and they started off with the passive model, but at somewhere along the way, they realized I have a lot to say. Um, this is working really well. I have a lot of traffic. Um, so now I'm going to turn this into more of a service business. I'm going to provide some level of consulting, or I'm going to provide, um, a, you know, a, a coaching that's paired with a digital product, a, a course or something like that. And we see this in all sorts of industries, hobby industries, um, uh, just really across the board. And, and we find that that's where people usually are able to jump from, you know, uh, five to $10,000 a month type passive income uh, website to a $30,000 a month website pretty well overnight just by um, having that sort of an offering and adding that to their, to their business. And that's when a lot of people just say, okay, I'm, I'm doing this full time. I'm, I'm leaving the job because all I have to do now is, is create courses um, it, within my industry. And then, and then I'm good to go. Mm. Uh, others take, sorry, I should add to that. Others take the passive model and the way they grow is by adding a second site and they kind of treat it as a portfolio. And it's just, I have multiple interests. I'm going to build multiple sites and, uh, if each one earns $5,000 a month, that's great with me. So we, we do see both. Yeah, that's very cool. So, you know, I started in, in the online business about 16 years ago and I had no money. I was a student and I, I learned there was no courses and that was the, uh, the, the online business world was completely different. There were no courses, no eBooks, like no one could teach you what you, what to do. The only way to learn was just by tinkering and trying yourself and trying to find some people who seem successful and asking them and following them. And eventually somehow I figured out how things work a little bit and started making some money and you know, building some websites, getting some traffic, monetizing them and so on, and then got into flipping and 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 all that and 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 now like buying bigger businesses. But I was always very curious to follow the, the journey of people who start and then they follow a path that's more structured, like like if income school versus a completely random one like I did, just doing a lot of different things and then eventually seeing what, which projects seem to work and which don't. And so it's very interesting how that path really works. Um, so I, I'm curious to see if to go for those 24 months to look to see how like more or less each step might look like from a person's perspective. And but the first question is uh, to get the certain revenue mark where they feel like the, the business is making a profit, right? What how how long does it take in terms of time? And let's say that mark is I'm not sure maybe a couple hundred dollars per month because you you probably at that point you're probably profiting versus whatever you might be spending right and then how long would you say it usually takes to get there which is the, the place where you know okay this is working this seems to be working i can keep going and then the second part yeah. is how much money do you think you can actually need you need to invest in order to get to a point where you feel like this is working and start making profits yeah to get to that point of profitability and saying you know even just a couple hundred dollars per month uh it, it, it does vary, but it is usually somewhere in the six months to even a year for most people. Um, and it varies a little bit just based upon, you know, how well uh, you, you kind of understood your industry uh, and create, crafted that original content in the beginning. And a lot of that just comes from, you know, we, we trust a, a pretty or, organic model when we build sites. And so we, you know, we don't, we, we, we don't do anything uh, to try to speed up the process of getting content to rank on Google um, that could be potentially harmful to the site later on. And so we teach people to create really good content crafted around search queries um, rather than just whatever, you know, is on your mind. Um, and then uh, we kind of 
trust Google to do their job. Uh, and then at some point, once you have a critical mass of content, start doing some real industry outreach, um, being, you know, getting yourself on a podcast, uh, that type of thing to just build some credibility and get some contextual links. And so it does take really about those six months for most people to even earn much of anything at all. But usually once you get to that point um, and your, your articles start hitting the rankings, uh, from there it starts to move pretty quickly. And so I would say it's in that around that six month mark. Um, and then, you know, the question around kind of what does it take to get started? That's the kind of the beauty of this business is almost everything you have to invest is sweat equity. It's just the, it's the work. Um, and it is work for sure. But uh, we're talking about, you know, registering a domain name, which uh, a lot of times you can get your first one for free with your hosting account. But if not, um, we're talking about 10 to $20 a year. Uh, we're talking about hosting. That's when you're starting off with a brand new site, five to $10 per month. Um, a WordPress theme. We have one that we've built uh, specifically, mostly for beginners to make it very, very simple, but still have a very fast, light website. Um, and so we provide that free of charge. But there are other themes out there that are free, some that are paid. But even so, if you were to get like one of the top professional themes out there, maybe $100 a year. And so there just aren't that many investments that you have to put into it. Uh, you know, you might invest $300 in your first year. And if you want the structured approach um, and join Project 24, you know, that sort of learning side of things, you know, that's going to add to that cost um, for sure. But it's, it's, again, the upfront investment in this business is very small. And so getting to profitability really happens within a couple months of starting to earn any income at all. Um, so again, in that six to probably six to eight month mark for most, um, and obviously it just ebbs and flows. We had a member who, uh, was there from the beginning and his first website, I mean, he just, he, he hit it right off the bat, just, uh, found the right kind of hole in the market. And within six months, he was already, we're already earning, um, about $3,000 a month. But I would say that's not typical. It's usually <laughs> in that six to eight month mark that you're, you know, you're hitting that hundred, two hundred dollars a month. So, what about uh, working with writers, content providers, instead of writing yourself? To you know, if if you don't like writing, for example, or like myself, right. maybe English is not, a, not not your first language. <laughs> sure. No, I totally understand that. Um, yeah, we we do recommend um, to everybody that follows us that at least your first batch of content, um, 20 to 30 articles, we recommend writing yourself simply because in the process of doing that, I think you learn a lot about um, what it takes to craft good content. Uh, nobody's going to care about your site as much as you do. Uh, um, and so we do find that there's a lot of benefit in doing that. However, we have a lot of members who, you know, at that point, um, some earlier, some later, but at some point they start outsourcing some of that content. Uh, we find that if you're going to do that, which is totally fine. Um, in fact, we have our, we actually have our own service, um, that we write for other people as well as for our own sites, uh, with, we have a whole bunch of actually college students who, who do that. And, uh, and it works really well, but we find that, uh, there are, there are some topics that are specific enough, technical enough, et cetera, where, you know, more in-depth knowledge of the subject is, is important. And so to get good content in some of those top, on some of those topics, you either have to provide a lot of information to the writer, uh, which is fine, especially if you just want somebody who's going to do a good job of crafting a good article, but you provide kind of the main information to them and they go write a good article. Um, or in some cases, it kind of works the other way around. They do the research, they write a good article, and you get it back and say, okay, now I need to, I just need to make some adjustments to make sure that it is consistent with, uh, with whatever I would say. And so um, really, it's not, it's not an opportunity to totally hand it off. Um, although, 
sometimes people do and it, and it still works. So it kind of depends a little bit on the niche, a little bit on the topic, but it does work. And there's a, there's a growing industry in that um, for sure in content creation for bloggers. I think a lot of people uh, after they've written 30, 50, even a hundred articles themselves say, okay, I know this works, <laughs> but it's kind of grueling and I'm ready to, to pass the torch and let somebody else write for me. And I'll just, I'll just own the content, put it all together, build the site, etc. And do many of your members buy sites, buy established sites, for example, go and find one for like free $5,000, $10,000 that is already earning like $100. And then you know that this is something that's working. And then you, you know that you can continue with that model and improve and grow it further. Yeah, and we're, uh, we're definitely seeing more and more of that as we have more members that are hitting that stage where they've built a site once now, uh, they, they know how this works. Uh, there's, I, I can think of one of our members in particular who I've talked with several times who um, I know he's, I, I'm pretty sure he's done some purchasing of sites, but the other thing he's doing is the, the content, uh, paying for content, and he's just building sites as fast as he can because he knows it works. And so he, uh, this is a person with a financial, a finance background. And uh, he sees this as just, you know, an amazing investment to diversify his portfolio. But uh, yes, we do. We do see members who kind of take that head start, take a concept that they know works um, because somebody's built it out to a, a certain level of traffic, a certain level of income, and then grow it from there. It's something we certainly do. Uh, we fairly regularly buy sites uh, and oftentimes we do look for those sites that are somewhere in that, you know, 5,000 in our case, we're willing to go up a bit higher, but, uh, we, we do often find some pretty good opportunities at, at that side of the spectrum for, especially for, um, you know, for a lot of our members who are, who are a little bit earlier at this and maybe don't have a lot of capital to invest, but just want that head start, um, is definitely something we do. And we see a lot of. Uh, yeah, and I find there is a lot of opportunities in those in those ranges um, because there are so many things you can improve. The easiest thing is you 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 buy a website that's making you hundred dollars through Google AdSense, and you uh, you set it up with a Zoic that often pays mm -hmm. just double that, or you find an affiliate program that converts well, and and that's instant improvement. Yeah, and. Uh, I think there are so many opportunities like that. And and the interesting thing is in that small range, it's it's very, very wide widespread. Uh, when you go a little bit bigger and you, you look at sites in, in five, six figures, there are still some opportunities, but but fewer and and it's often different, right? But then if you go right. further again, there is more opportunities. That's what we are focusing on now is like mid six figures and, and, and low seven mm -hmm. figure businesses which we acquire and they see that the opportunities are a bit different, right? Instead of just replacing ads or adding more content, you you have so many things that you can work with. Uh, like you can look at the, the current team at current expenses to optimize them. You could look at adding more traffic opportunities, traffic methods, monetization. So there's a bit of everything. Um, and that's and that's often exciting. That's true. I, I, I do find that very exciting. Uh, and they are very different. We, we do see that on the low end. Oftentimes we find the, the quickest and easiest turnaround on a flip for a website is often when it's the monetization, when you see that very easy low hanging fruit where almost with the flip of a switch, you can double or triple the income of a site. Um, and then either keep it in your portfolio or turn around and flip it a few months later uh, you know, again, for double or triple the, what you paid for it. Yeah. But then on the high end, sometimes it's little things that you can do, but like you said, there's more opportunities, but that little thing, um, in sheer dollars has a, a bigger impact because it's, it's a much, it's more established. You're, you're starting at a bigger point. And so a small change could increase the value of a website by, you know, thousands, tens or sometimes even a hundred thousand dollars yeah absolutely and like five ten years ago it was a big thing that people didn't know how to 
optimize the Google AdSense ads and uh, you, you, you would buy a website and you, you would simply take the ad unit from, from the bottom of the page and put it up the, to the top of the page and, and, mm -hmm. and the CTR increases by, you know, 3x. And now yeah. that's not the case because most people use automated Google ads. And that's what's interesting. Like uh, some opportunities disappear, but others come up. And I think there is probably always going to be some of those things you can optimize. Although the margins are probably shrinking a bit, so it's probably going to be harder and harder to find those. Yeah, that's probably true. And so let's let's walk through the that twenty four months journey. Uh, in the beginning, when you start, what is the first step? I imagine you have to decide the type of business and niche. How how do you do that? Yeah. So in, you know, in the very beginning, um, we we. We do have a process to help people sort of identify um, a niche that's going to work well for them. Uh, we do find that uh, one of the when you're building a site yourself and you're going to be creating at least a fair amount of content yourself, one of the most important factors in picking a niche is picking something that you can enjoy. Um, it used to be we would be pretty focused on how are we going to monetize this, how you know what. What's the competition like? And now we're a little less concerned with some of those things because we find people are more likely to succeed if they have some enjoyment and some back, maybe some background in that niche whenever possible. Uh, so we, we help people pick, you know, what's the right niche for them, uh, what, you know, so that they can get started. And then, uh, you know, picking a domain name and all those things that kind of go with it. Uh, we find that now you know, as SEO has really advanced over the years, it's less and less important to pick an exact match domain name. I mean, you don't need a domain that's purely just descriptive of the topic, but rather we shoot for something that's maybe a little bit more brandable, something a little bit memorable or, um, you know, so that obviously within the realm of what's appropriate for that niche, but uh, that's, you know, it just kind of evokes the concept uh, you know, one of the websites that I'm working on that we bought is called patentrebel.com. You know, it's so you're like, okay, it's about patents, but um, rebel, like, where does that come from? But it's just kind of something that uh, they felt was, you know, reasonably brandable. And so with that starting point, we help people set up the technology. We keep it very simple um, to get a website going. And then they jump right into content. We teach uh, how to identify the topics to write about. Uh, what people traditionally call keyword research. We, we call it search analysis. And the biggest reason is, you know, search engines aren't, aren't built around keywords anymore. Um, it's more about queries and topics. Uh, you know, the Google in particular has just gotten really good at the semantic search where synonyms mean the same thing. And so the search results end up really, really similar even if you type in a search multiple different ways. And so we focus less on keywords and more on topics and search queries, but we teach uh, our method um, to come up with a list of topics, a list of articles to write about. And then we teach exactly how to write good blog posts. Uh, we have several kind of different formats, but it's all built around what we call the post recipe. And basically it's just a way that helps people organize their thoughts um, organize their research and then just get it all out in a structured manner in an article. And at that point, it starts to become a little bit like, okay, now repeat, do this on the next topic, do this on the next topic. Uh, and so there's a phase in there where for about the first 60 days, usually for about two, maybe three months, we have people writing, um, about their first 30 blog posts. And we see that as sort of a, a launch off point with, we have people, I mean, publishing on their sites from the beginning. We don't wait until you have a certain amount of content to hit publish. But until you kind of get to a critical mass of content, at least 30 articles or so, you don't really have much to go on. Um, and so we try to get those first 30 in in about two to three months. And then from then on, most people are writing a couple articles a week and building up their sites. So the first 60 to 90 days is kind of where a lot of work gets crammed in. At that point, you can kind of 
start to get into a routine. And then um, from there, it's a lot of continuing with content creation. Uh, but at this point, it's hard. It's really hard. We call it the ghost town phase. It's kind of like you're, you're the mayor of this little ghost town and there's nobody there yet. Um, it's, it's, I guess it's like a reverse ghost town because a ghost town is after the boom. But this is, it's just a time where you're still, your content's still being tested. You don't really have any authority yet. Um, but you're writing content and you don't really know which articles are going to work. And so that's where that search analysis process, it, it is pretty important to, to learn it and get it right from the beginning. Um, but then in that, you know, really six to nine month time frame, your early content starts to sort of hit where it's going to, about where it's going to land in the SERPs. And that's when it starts to get even more exciting because now we can start evaluating a lot better. And we can use what we learn to uh, drive or to drive the way that we continue to create content on our websites, uh, the types of articles that we write. Um, we, we do a lot of uh, interlinking between our content to help, uh, it's really to help uh, get people, really get more page views, right? Get people to click through more, but also to tie different pieces of content together uh, to help build authority within that kind of sub niche within that topic. And then, um, you know, for, it's just kind of, we're in an optimization phase. We can take the things that we're learning from our, our original content that's starting to really hit and we can learn from it and we can improve the site. At about a year, we have a process that people go through to evaluate the performance of, of their early content and uh, determine if some of those articles would benefit from uh, being sort of revamped and improved upon. Uh, which articles are just doing really, really well, um, and which topics were just a miss. And again, we use that to inform sort of the next batch of content, but we also use that to update and improve upon the content that's already on the site. And so year two is just kind of more of that. Every few months, taking kind of the next batch of content that sort of hit its stride and, and reevaluating that. And we find that the more established the site is, the shorter that time frame is, it doesn't take, you know, if I write an article today on an established site, it doesn't take six, eight, nine months for it to perform well in the SERPs. Um, but when you're first starting out, I mean, we do, we definitely do some techniques to try to, to speed that up. we we focus a lot on, um, on winning Google rich snippets, writing content that's written in a way to win those snippets. We find that those can rank very quickly. We find that if we'll create some video content and put it on YouTube, oftentimes that's able to rank very fast um, and then use that to drive traffic to the site. So I mean, there's just so many different techniques, but um, that's kind of what that timeline looks like. The first six months is the most work, but after that, then it's we get to start optimizing and improving. And monetization comes in pretty much from the beginning on um, especially those passive income streams you know, uh, putting ads on your site, um, you know, finding opportunities for good affiliate links, that sort of thing. But oftentimes, you know, once people start to get real traffic within about that year time frame, then we start looking at other possibilities. We start considering, should we have an informational product? Should we consider consulting opportunity, et cetera? And so again, it's, that's like where it starts to turn into a business and not just like an online magazine full of content. Right. Very cool. So that's the first year. You you start with, you get a domain name. You decide on a topic that you actually enjoy. You write some content. You you, you use a simple WordPress theme that you provide, and and uh, you keep adding more content and then just wait to see the results. What about backlinks? What about social or any other ways to promote your content? Do you usually advise that? There's really what we advise is the importance of a lot of those things depends a little bit on the niche. There are plenty of niches where you can really just kind of put out content and it's, it's probably going to do great on its own. There are other niches where it becomes more important to have some authoritativeness um, in order to even rank well. And so, um, you know, at some point in there, when you do have at least those first 30 articles, if not 
uh, more. Then we do, um, we actually have a course within our membership that talks about how to build EAT with Google, the expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness. Uh, and that does include outreach within the industry. And we, we call it that rather than like, you know, backlinking or link building in, in large part, because the goal isn't just to get links for the sake of the algorithm. The goal is to, you know, build real trustworthiness within the industry um, to build a little bit of a name. Now that's not nece necessarily to say that um, you as the, as a person have to now become, you know, some sort of persona or, or something within the industry, but rather, you know, your site, et cetera, that, that needs to start being viewed as a trustworthy source of information. And so, you know, that might look like some outreach to, you know, write guest posts, et cetera. But, um, oftentimes I still find that I'd rather write an article for my site than for somebody else's, um, and let Google do the, do the job of, of putting it out there. Uh, and so we, we do take a different approach there than most people. For me, I'd rather, um, you know, meet with somebody and, and get on a podcast and use that as a source of outreach. Um, you do get a link oftentimes that way, usually, um, but even more so by speaking on the subject on somebody else's podcast, it shows a level of authoritativeness, a level of expertise. And so uh, that, that does a lot. And then in terms of social, we do recommend some forms of social depending upon, again, the industry that you're in. Some industries do really, really well on Pinterest. Um, a lot don't. And we're finding that oftentimes we're getting to where it's harder <laughs> to do Pinterest than it is to just put content on your website and let Google rank it on its own. Um, it's just gotten very, very competitive in Pinterest, like many social media platforms. Um, their interest in keeping people on the platform is only growing. And so if you create pins that drive people to your website, Pinterest doesn't really push them unless you're, unless you're using paid pins. Now you're, you're actually, you know, paying to have your pins seen. It's just uh, more and more. And Facebook used to be um, such that you could post, it gets seen by everybody that follows you or that likes you and follows you. And um, it didn't matter. But again, now Facebook's more interested in keeping people on the platform. And so unless you're, you know, paying to boost your content, it's not getting seen that much if it's the type of content that drives people away. And so um, social media is, is, is a tough one. It's a tough one to crack. And so uh, for a lot of our members, uh, we're not doing a lot uh, in part because if you, you can waste hours and get no benefit of it uh, if, if you're not really nailing it. And it just varies so much from niche to niche. One that's a little bit different um, is video. We find that that video content can do a lot uh, in terms of building up expertise and authoritativeness and trustworthiness. Uh, you build a lot more rapport with an audience when they uh, when they see you or listen to you than you do just when they read your content. And so, for people that want to build an informational business, uh, do consulting, uh, sell a course, etc., it's actually a lot easier to sell when the people feel like they know you and um, it's also a great place to rank for searchable, uh, very, you know, searchable terms, um, YouTube in particular, but other video platforms as well. And so that's one that we do recommend to a lot of people is, you know, go build a YouTube channel. And we actually have a whole course in there in project 24 for people that want to go the YouTube route and focus that direction instead of blogging. Um, but most people that do one eventually incorporate the other to some extent. So there's, that's really the biggest one. Um, podcasting is one we don't talk about as much these days, but it's a platform I really like um, for a lot of the same reasons for building, uh, building rapport with an audience uh, and building expertise, authoritativeness and trustworthiness. Uh, it's, a, it's a great platform. It's not, um, it used to be that getting your podcast discovered was a lot easier than it is today. So it's not a great discovery engine like YouTube is, but it's a great platform uh, for getting a message out. And so that's another one that I recommend to people, but we don't formally teach as much. So there you have it. I mean, social media is, it's, a, it's like running on a treadmill. You don't really, you, you can run and run and run and not get anywhere. 
if you're not doing it just right. Um, whereas when we create blog content, we write it today and we have an article that can potentially be ranking for, for years. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it, it's definitely a different animal. Yeah. That, that's certainly similar to what, what, what I found that with social media, it can be hit and miss, but we had episode 44 with, with Kate, uh, from simple pin media that she actually manages to consistently drive Pinterest traffic and uh, really got it down to a science. And how important is topic selection? Selection. Let's say you are someone who really likes cats and um, there is a million other websites or blogs about cats, all the breeds and, and, and everything there is to know about them. Um, and they all love cats too and they're pretty good at writing. So how would your content generate traffic and get better than others? Yeah. And you know, that is a, a great question and topic selection for your, for your site, for your business. Um, I would say it is important. You, you do need to make sure that you can identify at least some angle, something within that niche that is maybe underserved at very least. Um, but more important than that we find is the topic selection for the content itself. And so in most niches, as we start to dive into it through um, our search analysis process, the more we get into it, we, we do find that there are often underserved areas of content within that. Uh, and, and as you do that, then, then it's not really an issue. You know, it's like, okay, well, yeah, there's other people blogging about lots of people blogging about cats. They know a lot, but um, if, you know, if some of these topics just aren't very well covered, I can cover those and use those to build some initial authority. And then, then I'm in a position to be able to compete on some of the other, uh, the other topics. But the neat thing is um, with most topics, there are, there are kind of so many different angles to it with, you know, pets, with cats and dogs and everything. There are, there are so many breeds. Um, and oftentimes I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily steer someone toward building a site just around one breed, unless it's a very popular one. Um, sometimes they do very well, but, um, but I, I always like to pick a domain name. That's kind of at least one level up from what my content's going to be. So if I'm going to make a site about a particular breed, I'm probably going to pick a domain name. That's more like about cats <laughs> so that if I ever feel find that I need to expand because that breed's maybe not as popular as I thought. I, I have room to do that. But yeah, once you start to find kind of some of those, um, we, you know, kind of cracks, like there's a little crack in that niche that we can kind of pry into. And, and then when it sort of opens up, we find that there's whole angles that have been um, relatively unexplored. And I think that's kind of the beauty of it, uh, where the internet is so broadly used uh, across the world. There are there are new things that people are searching that have never been searched before every single day and um, new topics that people haven't considered before. And so I've gone into many different niches that uh, seem extremely competitive. And as you jump into them, you do find that there are topics within it that are just completely underserved. Um, I would say that to most people, if you're a beginner, jumping into like a, me a really medical topic, uh, fitness, um, there are uh, personal finance and um, investing, there are some of those niches where in addition to Google um, adding additional scrutiny because they're YMYL topics, they're about your money or your life. Um, and so Google wants to make sure the information is accurate, but they're also very, very highly competitive. I would caution anybody who's getting started now from trying to build something in those spaces. But other than that, there's usually some room. Um, it's just in some cases we have to dig a little deeper to find it. And like you say, cats, I mean, that's one, it really is pretty crowded. Um, uh, and I think it's just because people love their pets and there are a lot of them um, who, who blog about that. Do you know what is the success rate for those who, who go through the one year or nine months and really undo the 30 articles or whatever? What would you say just off the top of your head or with the data that you may know, the success rate of how many of them hit a certain revenue mark and really uh, that, that allows them to continue? 
Um, if I had to, just based upon kind of what's been reported, uh, that is part of the difficulty is everything's self-reported. And so we, when I mentioned before, we have those people that are very active in the community. Those also tend to be the people that are very active in reporting um, their progress. They're also the ones who are usually pretty active in building their sites. And so, um, you know, of them, I would say the success rate's very, very high. Um, again, if I had to put a number on it, in that, you know, six to nine month year, whatever time frame to hit the revenue targets, uh, I would say 50 to 70%, um, maybe, I don't know, maybe even a little bit more. If we were to go out of everyone who joins, uh, the number's lower. <laughs> I, I can't tell you how many emails I get of somebody who says, you know, hey, uh, I, you know, I signed up, I watched some lessons, and then I, I didn't have time anymore. Something came up in my life, and I didn't work on it. And so I'm canceling my membership, because uh, we do an annual membership. And I'm like, that's totally fine. I get it. And so we get a lot of people who have every intention to do it, and then they get into it. And they're like, Oh, I don't have the time to put into this. And so the success rate of all members is probably a lot more like 20%. And I think it just is because it comes down to how active you're going, how actively you're going to work on building this business. And I think you're going to see that in, um, I think in most industries where there's the people who take the learnings and actively build upon those. <clears throat> and then there's the people who you, you invest in it, you, uh, you pay for a course or whatever, because it's almost like you're trying to commit to yourself. I'm going to do this thing. Uh, and then, and then there's not the follow through. So that's where it's a little bit tough, but it's somewhere in that range. That is pretty good. If more than half the people who are quite active and take it seriously and commit to it, succeed, that is, I think a pretty good rate. And, yeah. uh, What are some, some of the most common mistakes that you see people uh, make uh, in your community that, that cause them to, to fail at, the, at growing their website? I would say the biggest one, it, it comes back down to the search analysis, the picking of the topics to write about. Um, we have, we've been, and we've been trying over the years, we recently, uh, this year, um, had a big update to all of our course material around search analysis uh, to try to Im improve the teaching to make it easier for, for more people to understand it. And still we find, uh, and, and so we're constantly trying to refine that. Still we find that there are people who it just, until it clicks in their mind, it, it's, it's not quite there. And so as we go look through someone's website and see the things they're choosing to write about, we, we say, you know, some, it's usually one or one or the other end of a spectrum. Either the topics they've chosen to write about are extremely broad. Um, I'll give the example, like um, uh, I was just recording a YouTube video yesterday or the day before, and we were talking about, for the example, um, cycling as a niche. And let's say that um, you're, you know, like, okay, I can create some content around psych, uh, bicycle maintenance. And so they go write an article called Complete Guide to Bicycle Maintenance. And we said, well, that's just such a big topic. Like what, all types of bikes and all maintenance you're going to cover in one article. And no, of course not. They're going to stay very superficial because they're going to fill up a whole article's worth of content without barely touching on most of bicycle maintenance. Um, and then you get the people that are like way down on the other end of the spectrum. And they're saying, you know, they're writing content around things like, um, I'll just make up this example, but like, um, how to, let's see, um, how to grease the chain on, you know, a specific, a very, very specific model of a very, of a, of a, um, competition grade road bicycle. It's like, okay, that's, that's a bit specific. And is it actually different than how to do the same task on all other competition grade road bikes? Uh, if it's not, then now we've created, we've created a distinction um, in our article where it's act, there's no real difference. Um, so, you know, if I, I could write a hundred articles <laughs> covering how to grease the chain on a hundred different bicycles and really the answer is the same. And so it's kind of finding the right level of content of how specific are we going to get? If we go down too far, the search volume 
is really is zero. Uh, if we go too high up, then we're not specific enough to really be helpful. And so that's, I think the hardest thing is helping people kind of dial in on sort of the right level of content to create where the search volume is likely to be um, there. It's likely to be existent, but at the same time, um, it's specific enough that you can be really helpful and that the competition is, is likely to be fairly low, um, especially for getting started. At some point you can write the higher level stuff uh, and the broader topics. But again, we'd, I don't wanna write an article on anything that's so broad that I can't give specific helpful pieces of information. Very good. And you mentioned you know, that you have a course on YouTube. If you had to just summarize it, what, what are some key things to do in YouTube to, to get noticed, to, to grow your audience? Yeah. Um, yeah. Summarizing it. Uh, it's funny. We've been, I've been working with, um, there's a YouTube channel called channel makers. Uh, the, the primary personality on that channel is a guy named Nate. Uh, he, it's actually part of income school. And I've been working with Nate a lot on a new kind of system for YouTube. And I would say a um, couple things. It's, I'm trying to summarize a lot of things up in, into just a little bit, but um, one is consistency of publishing. If you want to build YouTube for the standpoint, like of building an audience, uh, having a following on YouTube, um, really getting noticed, consistency, uh, whether it, it, some people are very successful publishing one video a month. I mean, Mark Rober is a very big YouTuber who publishes a video a month, but every video is really good, like viral quality. Um, there are lots of people who are successful with every two weeks, other people with one a week or two a week. And so it, that really how often is maybe a little, sometimes less important than um, the consistency of it. But I would say for most YouTubers, like plan on a video a week until you know otherwise, um, maybe more. The next thing I would say is um, understanding if you have to blaze your own trail, it's like you talk about um, the online business uh, sort of atmosphere of, you know, 15, 16 years ago, 10 years ago, even versus today you know, people like you were blazing the trail and it's hard because you have to figure it all out. There are a lot of people on YouTube who have figured it out. And so what, one of the things that we teach is like, let's learn from what those people have done. Let's look at what, I mean, YouTube gives us so much more data about everyone else than Google does about on blogs. And so we can see which videos get the most views. We can see uh, which channels get the most views. And so we start off by, you know, if there's an industry I want to get in, um, and I see that there are some really successful channels in that industry. I want to start off by learning from them, watching their videos and just learning what do they do well and what do people seem to like? Not because I want to copy that, but maybe because I can learn from some elements of that as I work on my own channel. And so we teach people how to do kind of an industry audit before they really put a lot of work into crafting a bunch of their own content. And then believe it or not, one of the other big things for YouTube is learning how to write a good title and make a good thumbnail. Um, most views on YouTube on successful channels come from the browse features, suggested videos, um, the up next kind of videos, et cetera, uh, getting on somebody's YouTube homepage. Um, and so if you have a thumbnail that's eye catching, um, interesting and enticing in some way within whatever is normal for your niche, um, and in, in addition to just being enticing and eye-catching, also helping people know what to expect. You'll, you'll notice that a lot of people who have YouTube channels about success on YouTube, they'll use the little YouTube play button icon somewhere in the thumbnail. And part of that is you, you know what to expect. When you see that, you're like, oh, this is a video about YouTube. Um, so it's that element that's kind of there. And so learning how to craft that in the right way and then how to write titles. Um, I find that titles that are merely just descriptive of the video for YouTube, I mean, they're great for search, but for those other features, oftentimes it's like we, we almost need to find some other angle in our video 
that's going to be more interesting. I recently published a video that was, um, it was just about Google not indexing pieces of content and just why they don't do that. And if I'd written the title, why Google doesn't index some content on your site, it wouldn't have done as well. But instead, I took one of my follies that I mentioned in the video, which was a site that, <laughs> uh, this is part of what happens when you start like outsourcing more of your work. But um, someone had checked the box to, there's a box on WordPress settings to discourage search engines from indexing your site. And someone had checked that box at the beginning. And I was like, why, why would anybody do that? I didn't even like think to check that because I, I would never do that on a site that I want to rank. And for five months, we were putting content on that site. And then I went and did an overhaul of the site and looked at it and saw nothing has been indexed <laughs> in five months. And so the title of the video was something along the lines of Google didn't index my site for five months, dot, dot, dot. And it was my fault. It's just a much more clickable title, even though the topic is the same, the content is the same. And so there's just a handful of things that are particularly important in the early stages. And as you, as you grow a channel, there's, uh, there's a lot of things obviously that, that come into play, um, on camera presence, all sorts of stuff like that. But, uh, I think if you can understand your industry and know how to market your content, I think those are some of the key, the key principles that will help your content stand out. And so Ricky, what, what actually inspired you and continues to inspire you to, to work on that? It's, it's a rather unusual business to really figure out and help people how to, how to build their own businesses. Is, is, yeah. that, is that just mostly based on your own early experiences of, of building your own business that, that you wanted to help others or what inspires you to do it? Yeah, um, you know, in the beginning for me, a lot of it came down to you know, interest in, in business in general. Um, I, I love business. I've been doing some form of, you know, business building, business creation for since college. Um, in addition to just having, I mean, I, I started off on the normal corporate career path. I was an engineer, um, earned an MBA, all that kind of stuff. But, um, I started working with Jim, Jim, he went to law school, but while he was in law school, he was working on his, a website. Uh, and he, he kind of like you, there weren't many people to learn from. And so he was figuring things out along the way. And it took a lot longer because of that. And so um, by the time we started income school, he had a system he'd pretty well figured out. It was not nearly as defined and established as what we've defined since then. But it was it was something that was repeatable. And so, um, you know, for him, he wanted to teach it, it was a little bit of a personal mission to help people. Um, to help other people to be able to sort of get out of the dependency on other companies or on governments or on whatever it is, and being able to be more um, self-sufficient when it comes to their income. And that, that was always part of it for me too, um, from the beginning. I, I definitely wanted to help people, but also like, I love business. Like I just wanted to get into this and really learn this one. Um, and then in the six and a half years since then, it, it became more and more of that mission for me. Um, I've really come to love the business. I've, I love the online space. Um, there's so, it's just so much that um, excites me about it. And so I'm very passionate about it, but I also love to teach it. Uh, as we started actually having people, you know, want to learn from us and pay us to, to teach them, um, you know, I, I took that responsibility very heavily. Uh, and I'm like, if, if somebody's going to be investing their time and their money in the things I teach them, I want to make sure that I actually help do everything I can at least to help them. And, uh, and over time, that's really what it's turned into. And I love the business so much that I'm constantly doing it. Uh, within income school, we have, um, we have a team of people dedicated just to working on our site, on our sites, on building sites from scratch and testing new things. Um, and so I, I do this as much as I teach it, but, uh, I, I, I just, now it, the drive for me is just, there's so many people that write me all the time and tell me this has changed my life. Like financially, I am in a very different place. Um, 
a member that I met in person um, shortly before COVID. Uh, he, uh, it's really, really neat because I catch up with him every so often. And I, I talked with him earlier this year and he, he said, yeah, I, you know, I got married and bought a house, like bought a house and quit my job uh, because of what I've been able to do in the last couple of years. And uh, I wouldn't have been able to do very much of that. Um, I'd still be at my job. I'd still be in my apartment. I'd still, you know, um, and just what it's able to do for people. And so I definitely take that responsibility pretty seriously, <laughs> but I love it. That's what drives me. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's amazing. Uh, being able to really help people start from nothing and, and go and uh, consistently build a business that's, that's profitable and earning them a living. I think that's amazing. Yep. Um, so thank you, Ricky. Uh, how can people find out more about you and Income School and uh, how can they join? Yeah, really, if you want to learn more about Income School, the best place you can go is really our YouTube channel, um, which is just at youtube.com slash C slash Income School. Um, and I'll definitely send a link. But um, also just at IncomeSchool.com, you can learn all about Project 24 uh, which is our membership um, right there on the home page. There's some information and, and a link to uh, incomeschool.com slash project 24, which is just where you just learn everything about what we have to offer in that membership. All right. Uh, thank you very much. And have a good day. Yeah. Thanks to you as well. Domain Magnet is a leader in buying and selling online businesses with a proven track record of expertise gained from over 300 deals since 2004. To learn more about how we can help you acquire or exit a profitable online business today, head over to DomainMagnet.com for more details.